Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on e-commerce in China. I hope you all can hear me. So what we're going to do today is um, I'm going to give you a, a, a webinar on e-commerce in China. Um, basically, uh, this, this webinar is going to be an introduction into the Chinese e-commerce market. So um, if you are already more familiar with e-commerce in China, this might, uh, might be some basic information. Um, but it's, uh, like I said, it's an introduction uh, in about 45 minutes that explains where e-commerce, how e-commerce has evolved in China and uh, where it's going, how mobile smartphones have played an important role and who the most important players are in the market. So this is a lecture that I normally do uh, as, as a guest lecture on universities and universities of applied sciences. And um, it's like, again, it's, it's meant as an introduction. Normally, it's followed by a couple of other lectures that go more deeper into the material. So something that I won't be talking about tonight is cross-border e-commerce. So how to sell your products into China. I'm only quickly going to mention it shortly. Um, I'm not going to talk about O2O and on-demand services like bike sharing or meals delivery, food delivery. And I'm also not going to talk about uh, social e-commerce. So that should give you the right expectations for um, what we're going to be talking about tonight. <clears throat> um, you should all see my presentation currently uh, with Jack Ma at the front. And I'm going to run through uh, the presentation that I normally give at, uh, at universities. Um, first, I quickly want to, uh, to introduce myself shortly. So, my name is Ed Sonder. For the Chinese people among you, or the people who already speak some Chinese, my name is Ai De. Um, that's the name I've been using since I went to China in 2011. Uh, I ended up in China because I was doing volunteering work. I was an international volunteer working with very small NGOs in the city of Xi'an. And you can see that in these pictures that I was basically teaching uh, those small NGOs around the kitchen table about <clears throat> marketing, because my background is in, in marketing and in uh, CRM. Um, in that capacity, I, I work with a lot of young people. So in the middle picture, you see me uh, together with the, the two ladies on the left are my Fanyi, my interpreters that I work with a lot. And I also had the pleasure to several times um, do a guest lecture at the Shanxi Normal University in, uh, in Xi'an. Um, in 2013, um, I returned to the Netherlands because I'm originally from the Netherlands with my uh, Chinese wife. And if you've lived in China, uh, it doesn't really uh, let you go. I mean, China stays with you. So I was really fascinated about especially e-commerce and digital uh, innovations in China. So I kept writing about that for several of the platforms that you see on the left. And, Besides the uh, university lectures that I uh, frequently do, I also speak about these topics on, uh, at marketing seminars, as you can see on, on the right. Now, every year what I do is uh, all of the articles I write, because I write about uh, one article every two weeks about a specific subject. I collect all of these and I put them in uh, these, uh, these books that you see. So I've published five so far. <clears throat> and they can be freely downloaded on our website, which is chinatop.nl. They're in Dutch, so if you do not speak or read Dutch, uh, I apologize. But if you do, you can get them totally for free um, uh, as a downloadable PDF or an EPUB file. Uh, if you prefer to have a printed copy, uh, there's also instructions on how to get those. But uh, do go to the website and, and download this free information. It's got much more detail than I can give you just tonight in this 45 minutes. Um, I also want to thank uh, the sponsors of this webinar. That's Hutong School, of course. Uh, for those who, of you who don't know Hutong School, they have some really cool programs. They uh, have very intensive Chinese language trainings, both inside China, but also several places outside China. And they also organize internship programs. 
So if you like me um, want to spend some time in China, get to know this uh, this important economy that's going to change the world, then uh, go and check out the information on their website, which is hutongschool.com. Uh, and you find all of the details of the, the products and services they, uh, they offer there. So back to the topic of tonight, um, uh, introduction into online China. Like I said, what I'm going to do is in the next 40, 45 minutes, I'm going to run through this presentation. And afterwards, you will have the chance to uh, ask some questions in, let's say, the 10, 10, 15 minutes that we have left. I'll explain to you how, how to do that. Um, what I'll also do is this presentation, I will upload it to uh, the handout section after uh, I finished it. So you can download it there and you can, you can save it and look at it again. Now, uh, a little warning, I'm going to be showing a couple of graphs and statistics. Now, don't get too scared about these because they're basically not all that much about the actual figures. It's just to show some trends. So the next couple of slides, um, we'll have some of those graphs and stats and just sit back and, and relax. Don't, don't get scared by that. So first of all, if we talk about the uh, e-commerce market in China or the internet in China, it's of course very important to realize how many people are actually online in China. Now in this graph, what you see is uh, around the, the turn of the century, say some, some 20 years ago, uh, there were very few people online. And this actual graph starts in 2005, but uh, in the days that uh, Alibaba started, uh, there were not really all that many people online. Um, we've seen that this ha has really increased very strongly, and that's all of the uh, the red bars, the internet users, to more than 800, uh, 800 million currently uh, in the first half of 2018. What we also see is, uh, and that's the yellow line, that uh, the growth of the number of internet users has decreased. So when it used to grow very fast, it only grows about like 4% uh, recent, uh, in recent years. And this is mainly because most of the people in, in the cities are online, but there's still a lot of people that are offline, uh, especially in rural areas. And as such, if you look at this figure, there's only about 58% of the total people in China, because there's like 1.3 to 1.4 billion people in China um, that are currently online. So there's still uh, a big gap to get the total population online. Now, what you also see is, and that's the gray bar, is that the majority of the people um, access the internet through their smartphone, through their mobile phone. Now, this is a very important and very specific characteristic for the Chinese e-commerce market. So um, it is something that we will uh, look into later what the reason for this is, but it is an, a very important driver of the market. Uh, if, you, if you look at that 58% of internet penetration, and you compare that to the rest of the world, and these figures are slightly different. These are from a company called We Are Social. Um, so they have it at 53%, uh, but let's just say that it's, it's somewhere between 50 and 60%. Now, what you see is that the uh, the internet penetration in China is actually just the global average. So it's compared to the rest of the world, it's not doing enormously well to get the uh, people online on the internet. As a matter of fact, you'll see a lot of, of developing countries in um, Southeast Asia that are doing much better. So there is still a lot to win. So even though in, in absolute numbers, there's, there's a lot of people online in China as a percentage, uh, it's still lagging behind a bit. But even though it's lagging behind, what we've seen is that the online shopping market has exploded. Now, GMV is gross merchandise value, and that's basically the, the volume of uh, the online market, the, uh, the online shopping market. Now, again, the, the, the absolute figures are not that important. It's more about the pattern. And what we see is that uh, even though the internet uh, online sales have exploded, it is still nowadays growing with, uh, with about 20%. Um, so it's still a very highly growing market, increasingly uh, fast growing market. Um, if you compare this to the, the GDP growth in uh, China, which is only about 67%, you can see that 
the internet is, is a, an important growth market for the consumption industry. And that's also why it's supported very much by the Chinese government. Now, if we go back to 2005, um, there was almost no online shopping market in, in China. Uh, the United States had about 35% in the total global e-commerce market, and China had less than 1% at that point in time. Now, if we skip to 2016, 11 years later, what we see is that China has already become the biggest e-commerce market in the world. I think that it, this actually happened in 2013. So now, currently, more than 42% of all online shopping is done in China by Chinese consumers. Uh, and it's it's clear that this is not the end phase that China is going into because, like I said, there's still 42% of the people that are not even online. They are still uh, not able to access the internet. And if you look at the, uh, the, the people that are actually online, there's also a portion of them that is not shopping online yet. So if you look at the total population in China, only 41% of the people have shopped online. Now, if you take into consideration that many more people will still be coming online and that the people that are online are not all shopping online, you can see that this is a market, a growth market that is far from, uh, from, a, from its end in, in growth patterns. Another interesting aspect is that um, <clears throat> the online shopping market has uh, sort of captured a growing uh, share of the total retail market. So if we take on and offline together, so all of the retail sales that happen in, in traditional shops, but also online, uh, the online portion used to be very small. So in this graph you see in 2011 was only about 4%. But nowadays it has already grown to more than 20%. Um, again, depending on which report you look at, the, the figures might differ a bit, but uh, you could say that one in every five uh, renminbi that is, is spent by Chinese consumers is spent online. The expectation is that this will probably level out to about 30% around the year 2030. But as you can see, there's, there's still a lot of growth potential. This also means that in certain cases, the um, online shopping has become a bit of a threat for a traditional offline shopping. Uh, businesses because it's taken more and more share of the total economy but at the same time the total economy it also keeps growing now in 2013 I, I saved this specific slide because um, I, I thought it was really remarkable that if you looked at the top 10 retailers in China um, and you looked at their turnover uh, and you ranked them in, in this this order Tmall, which is one of the Alibaba platforms we'll be talking about in a couple of minutes, Tmall was already the uh, the biggest retailer in China. And if you look at number five, you see JD, it's JD.com, uh, also known as Jingdong. And Jingdong at that time, so we're talking about five years ago, was already the number five biggest retailer. Now, all of the other ten, uh, all, all of the other eight in this top ten. They are all traditional retailers, and some of them, like Sunni and Gome, they also have their web shops, but they started out as traditional retailers. Um, but they were already um, smaller than, than Timo. Um, so e-commerce was already a bigger player in the market than, uh, than most of the traditional retail chains. Now, Besides the fact that it is a booming market and it's very uh, big and growing and there's enormous volumes of merchandise going around, what I normally find very interesting is to look at the reasons why this happened and why this happened so fast. Um, in the West, we've had much more time for these markets to develop, but in China, it basically all happened in over the course of five to 10 years. Now, one of the reasons for this strong growth in e-commerce is the, the rise in disposable income. Now, you're probably familiar with uh, China's economic miracle, the, uh, the economic boom that the country has seen since the opening up at the end of the, uh, the 70s and the beginning of the 80s, and especially in, in the 90s. Um, we've seen China become uh, the factory of the world. Um, now, currently, it is moving into a phase where 
China is also becoming a very important consumption uh, economy. Um, and as a result of this, the incomes of the, the, the people, the disposable income of the people has risen. Uh, in this graph, you'll see that in 2005, the average disposable income was about 10,000 renminbi. Um, and in the course of 25 years, it is expected that in 2030, it will have multiplied 10 times or it will have uh, become 10 times as big as it was in 2005. So the income uh, of, of the uh, Chinese people is rising very quickly. Now, at the same time, of course, the cost is also rising quickly, but um, at the end of the day, Chinese people have more to spend. But it's not true for all of the Chinese people because there's a lot of diversity within China. If you uh, look at this, uh, this, this illustration that Goldman Sachs did, you can see that about 50% um, of the, the people can be considered uh, rural workers. But there's still people that are living in the countryside or in very small towns and cities. And they only earn about $2,000 uh, per year on average. Now, the other category is the migrant workers. And most of these people have migrated, so to speak, from the countryside to the cities. Um, they have been very important for China's economic miracle because they are the ones that are working in all of the factories and producing all of those goods that we've been buying in, in the West for so long. Now, these migrant workers earn more. As you can see here in this estimation, it's about $6,000. And what they tend to do is they tend to send some of that money back home to their families that have remained behind in the countryside. So by doing that it's not just these migrant workers that have increased their income but they are also increasing the spending of the people back in the countryside and that has an impact on um, an e-commerce platform i'm going to be talking about a bit later called pinduoduo um, but the main target group for for e-commerce platforms and for e-commerce websites in china is the middle class and most of the times these are the people that are well educated are younger um, and are living in the cities and their average income can go up to almost $12,000 compared to uh, the West that's, that's still not incredibly much but it's, it's a lot uh, more than what people earn in the countrysides and these are the people that tend to spend that on, um, on e-commerce websites that we'll be looking at in a moment and of course you've got the very wealthy people uh, those, of course, are also spending uh, their money online, um, but they also tend to buy a lot of very extreme luxury products and do a lot of expensive traveling. And if you see those uh, Porsches in um, uh, driving around in Shanghai, for instance, that's this 0.2% of the extremely wealthy people that, that you might come across. So there's a big diversity um, in the country. Um, it's always important to understand that uh, there's, there's not just like one one China, it is very diverse in ethnicities, in income, uh, in rural versus urban. But what we do see uh, is that urbanization, so people moving from the countrysides to the cities, and this is something that the Communist Party has been um, stimulating over the last couple of decades, and urbanization uh, is accompanied by a rise in income. So in this graph, you see that there's more and more urban households. From, from 2013 to 2030. Um, and together with that migration, together with that urbanization, you see that the incomes are also increasing. So the Chinese people become more uh, affluent uh, bit by bit. And that's one, the, the first driving factor behind e-commerce. Now, a second factor is the system, a system that is often referred to as tiered cities or city tiers. Now, tiers are basically groups of cities with comparable size. So if we talk about first tier cities, we normally talk about Beijing, we talk about Shanghai, we talk about Guangzhou, there's about four or five, depending on the exact definition in China. And most of these cities are cities of around 20 million people. So they're really, really extremely big. Um, second tier cities are normally the capitals of all of the different provinces that you have in China. And if you go down further from that, you get fourth 
third tier cities, four tier cities, etc., etc. To give you an example, uh, my wife is from a, a four tier city in Shanxi, and um, I think they have about two or three million people still living in a four tier city. Now, what is so important about these city tiers in understanding uh, the rise of e-commerce in China is that outside the first and the second tier cities, there is often not a lot of retail. So if you look at these figures, um, you can see that in the United States, if you add up all of the retail floor space and you divide it by the number of uh, citizens in America, you get 2.6 square meter on average per person. In Japan, that's 1.3. And in China, a couple of years ago, that was only 0.6 square meters. So th this means that there is not an awful lot of shops on average for people to go to. And um, I'm pretty sure that in the first and second tier cities, this number will, will be much higher, but in the third, fourth tier cities and in the countryside, it's gonna be very low. So that means that certain shops and therefore also certain products were simply not available outside the big cities. Now, if you had money to spend, if you were from one of those smaller cities or the countryside, and you even had money to spend, um, you would have to travel all the way to one of those big cities to do your shopping. Now, that's what the Chinese call very mafa. That's, that's too much of a hassle, of course. But imagine that you get yourself a computer or a smartphone and you can go online. And you have all of these web shops with all of these products that you've never been able to buy in your own smaller city or in your town, but you can simply buy them online and they'll be delivered to you. So this is another factor that has driven uh, e-commerce in, in China. Then of course, there's discounts, uh, especially a few years ago. And, and also whenever a new platform is launched in China, there's a lot of discounts to be get for uh, for the consumers that shop online. So um, in this case, Chinese people, of course, like a discount, which we'll see later on again uh, when we look at Pindoto. Um, and most of the online shops just had very interesting offers um, that people could search for and, and could use. Another factor is the fact that the ownership of cars is relatively low in China. Um, the last figure I've seen, the latest figures were that only a, a third of all households actually have a car. Um, and most people do, uh, simply travel by, by public transport. They, they commute by metro or by bus. Um, and those people that have a car, they normally end up, if you've ever been in, in Shanghai or especially in Beijing during rush hour, it's totally congested. And it's, it's so bad that the government has basically split up uh, the right to use the road depending on your uh, license plate. So if you don't have a car uh, or you have a car and it's congested, it is, is not really easy to go shopping. Sometimes it's also very difficult to find a parking space. So with this lack of ideal infrastructure, it is quite often simply more convenient to have your products delivered at home. And that's what a lot of Chinese people do. Now, I'm gonna show you a little clip that might be a bit scary for those of you who are considering to go to China, but this is what the uh, rush hour in Beijing can be like. Now you can imagine that if you are going to shop and you have to drag your, uh, your, 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 your goods back into the metro system in a crowd like this, um, chances are that your new purchases will not arrive at home uh, the way you bought them. So it's another reason why people uh, tend to uh, shop online. But there's, there's a few more. Um, with all of the new internet companies that have uh, appeared in China over the past 20 years, there were a lot of investors with capital that were very willing to fund these new startups. And that's still happening with a lot of uh, more recent startups that have appeared in the Chinese market. Also, the government has told the telecommunication companies like China Mobile, uh, 
China Unicom, that they needed to speed up uh, the implementation of broadband, but also uh, the coverage of mobile internet. And since these uh, telecom companies are um, basically state-owned companies, they they have to follow the, the orders of the government uh, and the targets that they've been given. The government has also stepped back when e-commerce appeared in China. And they basically said, well, let's, let's see what happens. Let's see if this, this turns out uh, positively for, for the economy, which it did. And when it did, they decided to promote the internet. They saw that the internet have a, had a very positive impact on the development of the consumption um, economy. So they started to promote the usage of the internet in what they call the internet plus policy. Quite often, consumers can get higher service online than they can get offline. So that's another reason to shop. And uh, there is the issue of trust. In, in China, uh, there's a lot of distrust between buyers and sellers because they, they don't completely trust each other if they don't really know each other, if they're not part of their Guanxi network, so to speak. So um, there's been uh, new approaches in e-commerce with online payments, but also the development of B2C platforms that have helped the Chinese consumers to have more trust in buying things online. And I'll get into both of these uh, a bit later to explain how they've helped uh, the consumers to have more trust. So that's that's basically the size of the e-commerce market, how it's grown and the reasons why it has grown so fast in China. Um, of course, most of you will probably be familiar with Alibaba. And Alibaba is China's biggest e-commerce company. So what I'll do next is I'll run through some of the most important platforms that Alibaba has and some of their history, how it developed. So this is Jack Ma. Um, Jack Ma used to be an English teacher in the Hangzhou University. There's uh, several stories about how he was rejected from a job at KFC and, and other companies, which makes for a, a really uh, nice rags to riches story. Uh, but it, it is indeed a very inter interesting tale to, uh, to see what happened to this, this, this person in the, in the past 20 to 30 years. So he used to earn something like $8 per year working for the Hangzhou University. But several uh, decades later, in 2015, we see Jack Ma here. And he's not teaching students in Hangzhou anymore, but he's speaking to the people um, at Sabin. Uh, and these are quite important people. If you watch closely, you can, for instance, see Angela Merkel of, of Germany sitting uh, in the front row. So this has become a very prominent figure in uh, in the world. Uh, and it's all because of the rise of Alibaba. Now, if you're interested in this whole backstory, I would advise you to watch a documentary called Crocodile in Yangtze, which is a really inspiring and really interesting tale. Uh, it has a lot of footage and information about uh, how Jack Ma came to build Alibaba and what happened, especially up to 2008. And it's, ma it's made by Porto Erisman, who used to work for um, the company. Um, and it's really inspiring. Um, definitely uh, go and watch that if you, uh, if you can find it. So Alibaba basically started in 2000, uh, not 2000, in 1999 um, as a platform called Alibaba.com. And what you'll see if you open Alibaba.com uh, you, you probably notice that this is not in Chinese. It's all in English. And the reason is that this is a platform that is, is meant for the international market. So Alibaba.com, the original platform that Jack Ma started with, is a platform where Chinese, um, Chinese manufacturers and Chinese merchants can sell their goods to people elsewhere in the world. And it's become much more than that. It's now a total international trade platform, uh, business to business. So it's not a place where you go to if, if you're a consumer and you wanna buy something because you normally need to buy several hundreds or several thousands of a specific product. But it's used for companies that are sourcing products from other markets. So this is how, um, how it started uh, back in 1999. 
Now, what you'll see in that documentary of uh, Crocodile and Yangtze is that eBay uh, tried to get into the Chinese market. And when that happened, uh, Jack Ma and, and his uh, co-workers were very worried that if eBay would be successful, that they might also launch a business-to-business -business website and push out uh, Alibaba.com. So as a counterattack, what they did is they launched Taobao. And Taobao literally means uh, searching for treasure. And it was a C2C website, just like eBay uh, had. Um, C2C meaning that it's consumers selling products to other consumers or small businesses selling to other consumers. Uh, like I said, roughly the same as you'll see with eBay. Now, eBay has not been successful and, and left the market after a couple of years. And again, you can see that in the Crocodile and the Yangtze film. The Taobao has become the driver of the Chinese uh, consumer in, uh, internet uh, commerce market. So one of the important factors in, uh, for that success was Alipay. Because Alibaba quickly found out that that trust issue was holding back the development of e-commerce. So you had merchants that were selling materials on Alibaba's platforms because Alibaba, Alibaba's platforms are all marketplaces. Alibaba doesn't buy any goods. It facilitates the, the, the trade, the selling and buying between the merchant and the consumer. So again, just like, for instance, eBay does. So the problem was that these merchants didn't want to ship a product if the buyer hadn't, hadn't paid for it. Uh, at the same time, the buyers didn't want to pay for it if they were not sure that the merchant had actually shipped the product. So to, to solve this, this trust issue, Alibaba developed a payment system called Alipay. And I'll show you a small clip uh, that explains how the system works. Alibaba Group created Alipay in 2004. At the time, we noticed that buyers on Taobao Marketplace were unwilling to make payments before receiving and checking their purchases. Sellers were unwilling to ship products until they were assured that payment was coming. This lack of trust posed a serious challenge to the development of online shopping. That issue, the need to create trust among buyers and sellers, was the inspiration for Alipay. Alipay provides payment and escrow services for transactions on Alibaba Group platforms, including Taobao Marketplace, Tmall, and many third parties in China. Teresa Lee is a young professional who works for Alibaba and regularly uses Alipay. She will show how the escrow payment works. I shop quite a lot on Taobao and today I want to buy a computer lab desk so I can sit on the couch at home and work. At checkout, there are several options to pay for purchases. For example, the Alipay account balance, bank transfer or credit card. I choose to pay via bank transfer. And I just click here, type my password, confirm, and it's done. When my lab desk arrives, I'll need to check this product. It looks great to me. Now I'll just need to log on to my Alipay account to inform the system that I'm happy with my purchase so that they can release the money to the seller. Alipay also releases the funds if the buyer fails to object within a specified time period. Sellers are willing to do business because they're confident they will receive their payment. So in a low trust society like China's, this was a very critical success factor for uh, e-commerce. But there were a couple of other uh, success factors for Taobao to become as big as it became. Um, Alibaba also implemented a system called Ali Wangwa, and that was basically a chat functionality within the Alibaba websites, within the Taobao websites, where buyers and sellers could have a chat and ask each other questions about the product and maybe negotiate a bit about the price, which Chinese people like to do. So this facilitated a bit of haggling about um, what, what to pay for a specific product. 
Um, what was also very important is the system of rating, uh, rating of um, uh, basically reviews that people gave to the different merchants. Uh, you could earn hearts, and if you earn enough hearts, you could earn diamonds and then silver crowns and gold crowns. And the more positive feedback you had from your customers, the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the more crowns and, and jewels, etc., you got. There was also a lot of labels, which you see on the right side, that Alibaba used to ensure that people had the right trust to buy from, from the sellers. Now, the next step which Alibaba took, so it had Alibaba.com, it had Taobao. Uh, the next thing was, and that also has to do with the trust issue, um, launch the website Tmall.com. And you'll see that compared to Taobao, it, it looks a bit more, more fancy, um, especially if you scroll down. Um, it, it just has a bit more class. And that's because Tmall, or Tianmall, as it's called in Chinese, is basically a B2C platform. So it's no longer consumers selling to other consumers or small businesses selling to consumers. It's bigger businesses and brands selling to Chinese consumers. Um, again, still no goods are actually uh, ever owned by Alibaba. It's still a marketplace where buyers and sellers find each other. But the big difference with Taobao is, and this is an example that, that I always find handy, if you, for instance, as, as an individual person, find like a box full of Nike shoes, you can go on Taobao and sell those shoes to other people. But you cannot do that on Tmall uh, because you have to be either Nike, the brand itself, or a licensed reseller of the Nike product. So that's B2B, businesses selling to consumers. Um, and that is another development in, uh, in Chinese e-commerce uh, that made it more mature. Now, normally when I have an interactive session with students, I, I show them this picture and I ask them, what do you find remarkable about this? And uh, some students always say, well, there's, there's, a, there's a white Western baby in, uh, in a Chinese website, but that's not what I'm, uh, I'm getting at. What is remarkable about this picture is that you see on the top that this is the Tmall website, but it's an Amazon shop in the Tmall website. So Amazon has actually opened a shop in their competitor's website because Amazon is also active on the Chinese market. And they are selling some of their uh, fast moving goods through Tmall um, because basically, as you'll see later on, Amazon itself is quite small in the market. So, what they've do, done is they've decided that it's um, if you cannot beat them, you better join them. And they have opened their own shop in Tmall as well. So this shows how powerful uh, Tmall is in the Chinese market. Now, another example or another bit of proof of how powerful Tmall is, is if you look at the development of the market uh, split up into C to C. So that's basically what Taobao is and B2C, so business to consumer. Now, we see that, especially uh, in the past 10 years, the B2C market has really grown. And this is both Tmall, but it's also JD.com that has grown this market. And the total market is still growing and websites like Taobao will probably still, still be growing as, as an absolute figure as well. But as part of the total online shopping, we see that business to consumer is becoming more and more important. And that is another sign that the Chinese e-commerce market is, uh, is maturing, it's getting uh, more mature. So <clears throat> if you look at the total ecosystem of Alibaba, because we basically only uh, looked at Taobao and Tmall and Alibaba.com, but, but there's much more. So there's, you might be shopping on AliExpress and buying some of your uh, goods at an Alibaba platform, there's Tmall Global, where uh, international companies can sell their products to the Chinese people. Uh, Alibaba is also invested in Southeast Asia through a platform called Lazada. Uh, what you also see in the middle is that Alibaba has invested in a lot of media and entertainment companies. So they have Yoku, which is like the Chinese YouTube, um, and they have their own browsers. And on the far right, you see that they also invest in local services like food delivery through Erlema or Kobe. 
Um, so there's a lot of diversity in the total uh, portfolio of Alibaba. Now we've seen Alipay, that's a layer under that, that's used to facilitate all of the payment between these platforms. And logistically, Alibaba works with a network of logistical companies, and that network is called Signal. Then Alimama, which you see below that, is basically the system which brands can use to advertise on all of these different Alibaba platforms. And that is where Alibaba makes most of its money because they don't really uh, earn a lot of money from, from sales, but they earn money from facilitating um, the sales. And uh, merchants can buy banners and can buy search, advertise, search engine advertising within the Alibaba platforms. And all of this is run, of course, on servers and computer systems, and that is Aliyun uh, or Alibaba Cloud. So this is uh, from 2016. There's probably, if you look at it now, it's, it's much bigger even than that. But uh, this is the ecosystem of Alibaba. What is their strategy and what is their goal? They want to make it easy to do business anywhere. And anywhere, more and more means anywhere in the world. So in 2016, they've said that they want to grow from 3 trillion uh, renminbi in, in uh, global uh, gross merchandise value to 6 trillion in 2020. And they also want to grow their active buyers from 423 million to 2 billion consumers worldwide in 2036. Now, the ways that they are doing that is what you see below. It's globalization, so they want to expand their business outside of China. It's rural development. We've seen that there's still a lot of growth potential in the rural areas. So Alibaba's got several strategies uh, how to do that. And they also want to use big data because at the end of the day, Alibaba is a data company, as they also say themselves. Now, especially the first one, globalization, is one that worries a lot of people, uh, especially when you see a lot of news that Alibaba is opening stores uh, is opening offices in Europe. And then people think, oh, they're, they, they're coming to uh, take over e-commerce in Europe. But what most people don't realize is that these offices are actually business development offices. So the people that work there, the Alibaba people that work there, are going into the market to find brands and find companies that want to sell their products on a platform like Tmall Global to the Chinese consumers. So it's more of an opportunity for Western companies than it's an actual threat. Now that's Alibaba. Now let's look at, at two other very important e-commerce companies uh, that are, are claiming a big part of the market. First of all, JD, Jingdong. Like I said, JD is uh, also business to consumer, but the difference with Alibaba is that JD actually purchases most of the goods and resells it to consumers. So you'll see uh, the, uh, the JD website here. JD is also mostly known for its very speedy delivery. Within the cities, they deliver uh, sometimes within four hours or sometimes maybe even quicker. And they are also doing a lot of testing with drones, delivery drones. Now, the one that you see, the flying drone that you see on the right, is one that they use in the countryside. They don't use that in the cities because it's, it's maybe a bit too dangerous to have those things flying around all of those big apartment buildings. But what they do is these drones are used for last mile delivery. So if a package is the, uh, has to be delivered in a small village on the other side of a mountain pass, it would be very costly to have somebody drive there and drop off their package. So what they do instead is they put the package on a drone, the drone flies over those mountains and then the drone drops it off in that small village. And then somebody will collect that and uh, somebody will pick up their packages or deliver it uh, within that small town. So that's an, a very interesting thing that Jingdong is doing. A new platform, which is also highly interesting, is Pindordor. And Pindordor is, is maybe a bit more like Taobao than any of the other platforms we've talked about. What is important to realize when we talk about Pindordor is we've talked about those first, second, third, and fourth tier cities and, and the countryside. Now, of course, the middle class is mostly living in the first and the second tier cities, but the majority of the people are still living in fourth tier cities and in the countryside. As you see, 870 million people are living in those smaller towns. 
Now, in those smaller towns and in, in the countryside, as we've seen before, the average income is much lower. And a platform called Pindordo has become very popular among those regions. Why? Because they basically, what Pindordo does is they sell things at really extremely cheap prices through a system of group buying. Um, if you log into the Pindordo website, what you'll see in the middle is uh, you can buy some tea. And if you look at the, uh, I can probably help you a bit here. So you can buy this tea for 6.9 renminbi. But if you find two persons, a total of two buyers, so if you find a friend that wants to buy it with you, you uh, only pay 4.3, 4.3 renminbi. So the same with, with this thing. You normally buy uh, buy it for 79 renminbi, but if you find a couple of friends, you can buy it for 19 renminbi. So it's a, it's it's a website that stimulates uh, social commerce by sharing these deals on your WeChat. WeChat is the biggest um, uh, social network in China. Um, on top of that, on top of this group buying, there is uh, also. Hold on. There is also a lot of functionality within Pinduoduo to make you come back. So there's like prize draws on the Wheel of Fortune. And there's also certain deals which you see on the right, which have a very limited time space. So only for a couple of hours, you can get these very special deals. And people come back to Pinduoduo to get those. You'll also see, if you look at Pinduoduo, there's not an, a very clear search bar on, on the main page. And that's because you're not stimulated to search for products, but to browse through all of the deals they have for that thing. So it's a very different way of, of shopping. The products that you find can be extremely strange. Um, if you look at the right picture, that's a certain type of underwear. Now, uh, I do read some Chinese, but I don't read all of these characters, but I don't think I actually need to. I think that I have an idea what it's supposed to do. Then in the middle, you see a 3D like VR, virtual reality mask. And it's very unlikely that it's from, of high quality if you pay less than 70 RMB for that. And the thing on the right, I'm still not sure if it's a massage machine or, or a torture uh, appliance, but there's a lot of stuff like this on, on Pindor though. You find very strange things. And quite often the quality is not very good, but People do like to, uh, in, in smaller uh, cities, do like to use it a lot to, to buy that stuff. Pindoro has another problem, and that is that it has a lot of uh, fake and pirated goods. Like These are three examples of brands that have copied the Pampers brands of Procter & Gamble and are selling diapers um, and nappies at a very extremely low price. So that's Pindodo. So the, the biggest companies would be Alibaba, JD, and Pindodo. Now, Pindodo has been growing so fast that you won't even see it showing up in, uh, in the, the figures that I'm going to show you now. But in 2013, Taobao basically had the whole C2C market. There was still a uh, platform called PiPi, which doesn't really exist anymore nowadays. But if you look at the B2C market, there's more competition. So Tmall of Alibaba owns about 57% uh, of that market and JD about 27%. And as you can see, all of the other companies are much smaller. And Amazon, which we've seen earlier on, has less than 1% market share in the Chinese market. Now, I also have a figure because these are actually already a year old and, and Pinduoduo might still be part of the other category that, that you see here. So it is not even trading up, but it's now already the number three company the market. If you add all of these uh, markets together, so C2C and V2C, consumer to consumer and business to consumer, for mobile sales, you'll see the actual impact of Alibaba, that they have more than 80% of the total e-commerce market. And uh, JD, if you also take into account the uh, C2C market that they are not really playing any role in, uh, goes down to less than 8%. So this is what the Chinese market is like. It's basically a duopoly. Maybe not even a duopoly. It's, it's almost a monopoly of the uh, Alibaba company. 
Now, the Alibaba company has also become very uh, well known because of Singles Day. And this is a picture of 2013, I think, when Singles Day was still relatively new. Singles Day is a, a shopping festival where people are stimulated to buy all kinds of deals. And Alibaba stimulates the merchants on their platforms to give away big discounts. And it has resulted into enormous sales year after year after year. Now, I won't go into, into detail because we don't have that much time left, but one thing that I find really remarkable is the figure that you'll see on the lower left, that 90% of all the sales that was done in 2017 during Singles Day was done through mobile phones. And that's the, uh, the part that I want to close off with, and that's about e-commerce. So what you see here is that in 2017 or 2011, there was basically very little e-commerce sales happening through mobile phones, but it's been exploding since then. And that has to do with the arrival of smartphones in the Chinese market. If you look at uh, the current figures, more than half of all of the, uh, the online shopping is done through mobile phones. Now, I want to show you a couple of things that explain why that is. What's, what's the reason behind this? Now, here you see that Chinese people own different types of, of devices. So some people do own a laptop, some people do own a desktop, but most people own a smartphone. And as you can see, there's also a lot of people, almost 30%, that don't, they only have a smartphone and don't really even have a desktop or a laptop computer. Um, and most of the time, these are those migrant workers and people in rural areas that I've talked about. Because what happened um, a few years ago in China is that China saw the rise of their own brands of, uh, of e-commerce, or, or sorry, of smartphone uh, manufacturers. And they've made phones that were much more affordable to the Chinese people. Now, on the left, you see the iPhone, and the iPhone is still quite popular with affluent Chinese uh, people, of course, but it would cost you about 6,000 renminbi, which is almost like $900 to buy one in China. It's actually more expensive to buy it in China than uh, to, to buy it uh, outside China, even though they are manufactured there. Xiaomi is a company that made a phone for half the price, which had comparable functionality with the uh, Mi Note Pro that you see in the middle. But Xiaomi also made very affordable, cheap phones for less than a hundred US dollars that people that were not very wealthy and did not have very high disposable incomes could save up for, and then they could buy this. And those are the people in the rural areas and those migrant workers that work in the factories and in restaurants in the cities that have been able to afford a mobile phone and go online and by going online, they can now also uh, purchase in all kinds of different web shops. Which brings us full circle to the, uh, the first picture that I've shown you. As you can see, of the 802 million people that are currently online in China, 788 are going online through the uh, mobile phones. Um, so the mobile phones and the rising economy uh, are very critical factors in um, in the e-commerce growth. I've talked a bit more than I was uh, supposed to, but we still have some time left for questions. If you look at your uh, control panel, you see an, an orange button. If you open that up, you should see a chat window and you can enter your questions in the, the chat window. Um, and I'll see how many I can, uh, can answer in the next couple of minutes. So, anybody have any questions? So, I have a question. What direction do you see this trend going into? Um, I'm not sh exactly sure what... Uh, if you mean the growth of e-commerce, there's a couple of things going on. Uh, eventually, the growth of e-commerce will slow down. 
It is still growing by about 20% each year, uh, but it will probably stagnate um, or, or start growing with the rest of the economy at the same pace around 2030. So what you see happening currently is that um, a lot of the internet companies are going into what they call new retail. They are actually starting to help the offline retail businesses also by investments to become more integrated with, uh, with online commerce. Um, there's a lecture I did, which you can find on YouTube if you search for Ed Sonder and New Retail. It's about half an hour where I explain what New Retail is. Um, and I gave you lots of examples of Alibaba's Kurma stores, but also of um, unmanned stores by Bingo Box. And that is a definite trend because the e-commerce companies know that eventually their growth will stagnate. Another uh, trend is, of course, the globalization. And that globalization for e-commerce companies in China will mainly take place in emerging markets. In Southeast Asia, in uh, Russia, AliExpress is, is becoming quite successful in, in Russia. But it's mostly in Southeast Asia uh, through companies like Lazada, Alibaba is investing in. Okay, there's um, a question. Which sources would you recommend uh, to find information on Chinese e-commerce market? There's uh, several websites that have uh, information on this, like iResearch has a lot of statistics. If you want even more statistics than you've uh, just seen in this presentation, um, eMarketer sometimes has uh, statistics. Uh, if you want to read a lot about Alibaba, you can go to alizala.com. Do take into consideration that this is basically a PR website of Alibaba, so you sometimes have to take things with a grain of salt. Um, also, there is a website called TechNote, and TechNote is one of the best websites to go to for um, information on uh, anything that is happening in China or uh, in, in the area of uh, digital e-commerce, etc. Um, besides that, there's, there's a lot of... So if you can hear me again, I just lost my, uh, my headset. Uh, besides that, there's, there's a lot of also Chamber of Commerce like um, organizations like the EU SME that also have a lot of uh, interesting papers available and a website by Fung Business has some very interesting reports as well. So, but, but normally if you just Google a bit for, for e-commerce in China, you should be able to find uh, a lot of interesting stuff. Um, there's a question about competition. Uh, what is the competition like? The competition in China is extremely high much higher than we would see in, um, uh, in Western markets, mostly because these two companies, especially JD and Alibaba, uh, are very big, uh, have very big budgets, have, have also quite often the support of, uh, of funding companies. So there's a very fierce battle going on, also because it is much more than e-commerce. Both uh, companies like Tencent and JD and Alibaba, they are also active in ride hailing, in food delivery, in all kinds of, of other on-demand services. Uh, and wherever one of those companies comes with a new service, you'll see it immediately copied by the other company. And there's a very fierce battle for, uh, for market leadership. Um, so it is extremely difficult, as you've seen with Amazon.com, uh, to get into the, the Chinese market. Um, if you want to sell your products, there are various channels that are already available, like through Alibaba and JD that you can sell your products to. But it's it's not recommendable to try to start your own e-commerce company in China. Okay, um, we're out of time. So I thank you all for your, uh, your attention. 
I'll be uploading the uh, handouts to, um, to the handout section in a moment. And if you have any further questions, just feel free to contact me through the details that you have on this slide by, uh, by email or by any other channel. And uh, yeah, I hope you, uh, you enjoyed it. So thank you very much.